Hi, my name is Sashi Pereira and this is Serious, a series where we talk about how unequal our world is. Hold on, here's a logo coming up now. All right, back to me. This is a series where we talk to people who work to challenge the systems that keep people living in poverty because we know that inequality is no accident. They're the result of global systems that actively deny people their right to learn and a living and live life to their fullest potential. That's enough from me. Today, I'd like to welcome our guest, Melissa Bunkaris, who is Oxfam Australia's Climate Justice Lead. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Melissa, what is loss and damage? What are we talking about here? Yeah, so I guess loss and damage um, is like the third stage of climate action um, when it comes to climate change. So the first one that we often talk about is reducing our emissions and we call this climate change mitigation. Nailed it. Tip. Nailed it. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know if we have, <laughs> but, um, but that's the first one and that's a really important one because we really want to address the, the climate crisis and that's the critical way we do it. Now, if we're not doing a great job at mitigation, we kind of go to the second stage of climate action and that's climate change adaptation. So that's helping people adapt to the impacts of climate change. The third one is when we haven't done a great job at that either and we haven't been able to adapt or we haven't had the opportunity to adapt, then we go into climate loss and damage. And so this third stage is really where we need to take action because people are losing livelihoods, they are losing infrastructure or their damaged infrastructure and perhaps there are different elements of their lives that are being impacted by climate change in, in ways that um, are affecting their identity or their culture as well. It's relatively new for a lot of people in the climate space and I think that was because we were all desperately hoping we would never have to deal with the impacts of climate change but that's become a reality now and so this is where this terminology has come. I think a lot of us were hoping if we just didn't think about it, it'd go away. Exactly. I think that's been the general, just, you know, just don't think about it. Who are we talking about here? Who are we talking about that's impacted? Unfortunately, when we think about loss and damage, um, the people that are really the most impacted are those communities on the front lines of climate change. And that's often people who are um, living in poverty, people who are facing inequality, they're quite vulnerable, um, but also, you know, there's particular parts of the world that are, that are more impacted by this. And so we see places like um, small island countries that really feel the impacts of climate change more heavily as a result of their location. I feel like I only really woke up when the bushfires happened in Australia and I thought, wow, what we were worried about is here. You know, we can, we can go back at least a decade or so. A lot of people who are living kind of um, subsistence agriculture or they are subsistence um, fishermen, they also notice those changes much more acutely than we might do in our urban uh, lives here in Australia. Hang on, um, I have got Usaya here. Let's have a quick chat to him. The village that um, I'm residing in right now, or the Koba in Moala, uh, already been relocated once and um, the next village of uh, Wunuku is one of the 43 villages that need to be relocated. This sounds very serious so I kind of I understand the need for the series now. Are there ideas as to who will be contributing? Like I know it will be the people who have been polluting the most but yeah any other factors behind there? Yeah, we, we do really want to strongly encourage this kind of polluter pays principle, it's, it's sometimes called. So we'd really like to see those who have profited the most from uh, fossil fuels to also be those who help support these countries and, and the loss and damage fund. Because of the way the UN works, it is mostly the states, so governments that are negotiating in this space, but that's not going to be enough. The scale of the problem is huge and potentially going to get bigger. Can we get some of the billionaires going to space to chuck some coin this way? Look, Oxfam's done a lot of work on, uh, on billionaires and the inequality that exists. And we know that um, billionaires have been profiting over recent years and that there is huge inequality in that space. So David might be able to tell us more about that. Hey Sashi, hey Mal. As Mel mentioned, um, a lot of the finance actually comes from public sources. 
Um, and actually, 2009, um, wealthy countries, including Australia, agreed to give $100 billion per annum um, to developing countries by 2020 to reduce their emissions and adapt to the impacts of climate change. Um, and this is on top of, this is separate to loss and damage. Um, wealthy countries also need to kind of support on that. And that's a kind of an emerging area of policy. In any case, um, this goal, this $100 billion goal has never been achieved. It's now 2023. Yet to do that. And it's not like that. It's not like we don't have the money like in 2022 australian billionaires actually increased their wealth by 61 percent during the pandemic um and in the same year the australian government gave away 11.1 billion dollars in subsidies to the fossil fuel companies so we have the money it's just just not going to the right places so a good option for australia is actually to implement a wealth tax you know if we're talking about polluter pays it's the wealthiest among us who pollute the most um, and according to our calculations um a wealth tax of between two percent and five percent on those with a wealth of over $7 million would raise more than $29 billion for Australia. Um, that's a lot of money and that could do a lot of good both just for addressing uh, inequality in our country but also funding kind of climate solutions uh, here and also overseas for our uh, neighbours. Anyway, hope that helps. Uh, back to you. When these initial negotiations around the climate crisis um, emerged in the 90s, there was this agreement that people who were living in low income countries hardly contribute to that. And it's something like 0.5% of their emissions, uh, of the emissions have come from countries in the lower income category. Whereas when we look at those higher wealthy um, countries, we know that something like 92% of those historical emissions have come from those countries. So there's a huge inequality in terms of who's contributed to the climate crisis. And I think that's recognised in in the climate, the way that we address climate change. That's really nice that that's been accepted. <laughs> wow, responsibility, that's really nice. I think in the 90s it was really well accepted, but it, over time it, it's become more difficult because countries' wealth has changed um, as some countries have become wealthier. And so they've been asking for this for some time. How close are we to it? Sadly, there's still a lot of quibbling. <laughs> quibbling, the <laughs> kindest word I can think of, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With the loss and damage fund that's being negotiated this year, um, we are getting closer, but there are still some really critical questions that haven't been answered, particularly around eligibility, particularly around who pays and where the money comes from. We've got to the end of the year Great. until the COP. <laughs> so uh, it's COP ticking on. We will see if we can get some uh, results by then. And do you have any general advice for people out there who are feeling very stressed out about climate change in general? I think it can be really overwhelming and I certainly feel it too and I, I work on this God, day in, day out. Sam Australia, lead <laughs> if you're feeling stressed, my gosh, yeah. But it goes through ups and downs and I think, um, you know, there's always hope and that's why I continue to show up in this space. There's always little stories that give you so much hope about our capacity as humans to really respond. We just need to continue finding those little glimmers of hope and hope they all build together and give us a really big picture that can ensure that we see kind of justice and equality really represented in our, our global response. We don't forget the people who are really feeling the impacts the most. It's really put some wind back in my sails. Thank you, <laughs> it's very exciting. Thank you so much for watching. If you're interested to learn more, please keep an eye out for the other videos which will talk about wealth inequality, inequality between genders, and our work with the First Peoples of Australia. Let's roll to the credits. <laughs>